Hello, welcome. This is a history of modern philosophy, and my name is Mark Dorsby. In this video series, we're offering a series, a survey of some of the key modern philosophers, looking stretching back from Descartes all the way up to Nietzsche. I encourage you to follow along. The book we're using is Classics of Philosophy, although, of course, you can get almost all of these, or really all of the texts we're looking at, online for free, so there's no reason not to follow along. But if you get the book, it makes it a little bit easier because you can just read each chapter. Now, uh, let me begin before we start jumping into today's topic, and we're going to give it some, some preface by sort of remarking what we've looked at previously. In our first video series, we began the history of modern philosophy by looking at the work of René Descartes. And in particular, we looked at his notion, um, his problematic, of what, if you doubt all things that can be doubted, what follows, what can actually be known. And of course he doubted that he even had a body. Eventually he was able to, to work his way from the supposition that if we, that when we say, when we think we necessarily exist, from that supposition he works his way all the way to an encounter with the world. Um, from there we looked at Thomas Hobbes and we took a look at how Thomas Hobbes argued that um, ultimately uh, we looked at sort of how Thomas Hobbes articulates a materialist and secular conception for understanding the legitimacy of government. Now, Thomas Hobbes, though though his text, whoops, pardon me, though Thomas Hobbes' text begins, um, ten, was written and published 10 years after Descartes, there's a clear difference between the problematic of Descartes and the problematic of Hobbes. Today, what we're going to see is we're going to follow the train of thought of two different philosophers. First, we're going to look at um, Blaise Pascal, and we're going to look at his articulation of the wager. And the second philosopher we're going to look at is Baruch Spinoza, who was a Jewish philosopher from Amsterdam. Both of these, these guys lived in the 1600s, and both of them are responding directly to Descartes. Um, both of them are brilliant geniuses, in fact. Uh, but I will say that we're going to start off with Pascal's wager, and then we're going to look at Spinoza. And as you can see just from looking at the screen here, I have a lot to say about Spinoza, but I fear that I don't really even have enough to say about Spinoza, and I think you'll know what I mean later. Um, you, one thing I want to emphasize is that really today is... Even though Hobbes is sort of kind of a parallel trajectory to Descartes, but we're going to see, we're going to fall back into line and see the two philosophers who are immediately um, indebted to the work of the meditations in Descartes, particularly that of Spinoza. You might say that the topic we're looking at today really looks at the problem of rationalism and no, thinking about what is the relationship between reason and the infinite, we'll see that the central topic for today's to, um, discussion is the concept of God. And what exactly God is, um, and what God's relationship to the infinite might be, and how that would relate to us. And here, it's critical to remember that in Descartes' meditations, the notion of an infinite perfect God as an innate idea, plays an absolutely central role. So we're going to see both Spinoza particularly addressing that concern. Uh, but with Pascal, we're going to look at the question of God. So let's jump into it right now. Welcome back, everyone. So let's start off with Pascal, uh, Blaise Pascal. And I have to say, I'm not French, so I'm probably going to be mispronouncing some of the things here. So please forgive me. I know that the people who are watching and my students uh, may have more knowledge than I do with regard to pronunciations and things of that sort. But let me begin by sort of saying something quickly, which is Pascal lived, let me give you sort of the general bio the treatment of him. Pascal lived from 1623 to 1662. Um, he was a scientist, a philosopher, a mathematician, and what we might call today a definite Renaissance man. The guy was an absolute genius. He also was quite highly influential in terms of articulating the mathematics, the mathematics of probability. He was born in Clément Auvergne, France, and he was the son of a nobleman and a government official. So he grew up uh, well educated and fortunate as a consequence. Um, and by age, but the guy was a genius. It wasn't just because he was educated well. Um, we, he was by age sixteen. He wrote his first treatise on conical sections in geometry. So he was doing geometry at a very young age, at least compared to most of us. By age 18, he actually invented a calculating machine. Um, we probably wouldn't think of it as a calculator today, but by all intents and purposes, it was a calculator. He also invented the barometer, 
after doing some work on trying to figure out what a vacuum was and doing work on vacuums. In 1654, famously, he, under, he underwent an important religious experience, at which point reason in mathematics and science always played a central role for Pascal, but after his religious experience, all of his intellectual energies um, really circulate around his conception of God. And we're going to see that play center role in today's discussion. Now, Pascal authored many things, but his key philosophical work is called the Pensiers. And I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Let me know in the comments. Uh, but the Pensiers translates roughly as thoughts. And so these are his thoughts. Um, and there's a lot that he discusses in that text. We're only going to be looking at one argument he gives from that text, and that today is known as the wager. So we're going to be talking about the wager today. Um, sometimes people call this just the wager for God's existence. You're going to see, though, that ultimately what the way the structure of Pascal's argument it works is he doesn't think that we can have a proof for God's existence, not like Descartes thought, but he does think that it's highly probable that God exists, and in fact, if we're going to bet one way or another, if we think of it as a wager, a bet, then we ought to wager that God exists. And we're going to lay out the reasons for why Pascal argues that today. Now, the first sort of uh, proposition that we need to address is the notion that God is understood as being distinct from and separate from humans and other things in the world, or if you will, the world in general. Um, Whereas humans and things in the world are all finite. Now, what does finite mean? Finite comes from the Latin word finis, which originally meant boundary. It means a limit or a boundary. So anything that has a boundary or a limit, we can say offhandedly, or, or rather quickly, that anything without a limit or a boundary is finite. So, for instance, I'm a human being, you can see me right now, there's a limit to my extension in space, right? My fingers only go so far and then they stop. So I have a finite, I'm a finite being in terms of my body. In terms of my mind, I'm also finite because there are many things that I am unable to think or to cognize. The most important of which today is the concept of the infinite, which of course God is considered infinite. Now, what is the infinite? Now, obviously the root word of the form infinite means the negation of the finite. So literally the infinite refers to, or etymologically, the word infinite refers to the idea of something being non-finite, that is without boundary, without limit, right? This is the notion of the finite, infinite, and we're going to see immediately that there's a problem, which is namely Pascal does not think it's actually possible for us to cognize the infinite. And this represents a first major <clears throat> break or demarcation from Pascal and Descartes, from Descartes' philosophy. If you'll recall, in our previous video, in our first video, we looked at Descartes' conception of God, and he argued that God was an infinite, perfect being. But Descartes argued that these co our concept of the infinite could be understood in a positive sense. That is, we could actually make, we could actually understand what the infinite actually entails and what it actually means, um, right? Uh, this is what Descartes thought, and he staked everything on this claim. It's such that he said that the only way that we could get this positive conception of infinity was not from us because we're finite, but from God, who's infinite. And he, this is his famous trademark argument. So the notion of God being an infinite being is like a trademark that God has left within our mind, an innate idea, and so on and so forth. We're going to see that Pascal, a mathematician, disagrees with Descartes, which means that he does not think that the arguments for God's existence succeed. Now, before we go further and sort of laying out what this means, it's important to sort of at least... Uh, have some a moment of recognition in which we realize that if Pascal is right, Descartes' meditations fail. This is very important because really one of the ways that you can understand the history of philosophy is to re history of modern philosophy is to realize that with Descartes we get this problem, which is namely how is it that we can can when we're certain of our own subjective existence, how can we be certain of an objective world outside of ourselves? For Descartes, the concept of God and the proofs for God's existence 
provided a bridge to the world such that it would be conceivable that if God was not a deceiver, that we could, in fact, know that there's a world outside of ourselves. But you can see here is that if Pascal is right, and there is, in fact, no proof for God's existence, then that would entail, and if there are no innate ideas, then that would entail that it is not, we're not able to resolve the problem of Descartes, and that is we're left into our, we're left with the certainty of our own subjective existence, but not much more. So this is a really important thing because you're going to see in a certain way, all of modern philosophy is about trying to come to terms with this initial problem of Descartes' meditations. And I think we can understand the wager in Spinoza is in that, in that vein of thought. And I think we would be correct. So, okay, so on the one hand, let's go back to the argument. We've got God is an infinite being, right? And humans are finite beings, okay? Now, first off, what are some of the characteristics? The first is that the finite is annihilated to nothing in the presence of the infinite. Pascal seems to suggest that the infinite is categorically and qualitatively a leap forward and beyond that which is finite, to the extent that the finite is just completely nothing in the presence of the infinite. Even consider the notion of counting, right? Let's say you count from one to five, and you have a finite count, right? One through five. The infinite, however, if you wanted to count infinitely, then you would, it would, it's very, very difficult because not only would you have to begin counting and never stop, but you would also have to count in both directions, both into positive numbers and into negative numbers. But you can see here, a count of one to five in comparison with an infinite count that just goes on and on in both directions is, is, is so far beyond the finite that it, the finite just gets annihilated. It just it gets vaporized in the presence of the infinite because the infinite represents a qualitative leap that the that just can the finite cannot be extended to meet. So what this means is that we are ignorant of infinity. Now we obviously have a concept of infinity, right? We're talking about it right now, but we're ignorant in terms of what the infinite means in terms of it referring to a positive form of existence, right? So I can imagine, for instance, that there's things in the world. For instance, here's a cup and here's a being in the world. It's finite. And I can imagine lots and lots of finite beings. But to imagine a being or some sort of substance that has absolutely no boundary whatsoever in principle is not something I can actually imagine. And if we think of it in terms of mathematics, as Pascal does, infinity is not positive. It's not negative. It's not really odd or even, right? So you can see that if we're going to just compare infinite numbers to finite numbers, there is just a cataclysmic, or maybe that's not the right word, just a, a definite chasm between the two. Um, so we're ignorant of infinity. This actually becomes an important point for Spinoza as well. And it's this notion that this means that we can't really cognize God. Right? Because if God is infinity, then that means that God, at least in and of itself, is an incomprehensible notion. Why is it incomprehensible? Because if God is infinite, then that means that we tend to think of, of the infinite as being a com combination of a whole bunch of finite things. Right. So if you count, and you count infinitely, you're combining a whole bunch of things. But you could see that since the infinite is neither negative, positive, odd, or even, and since it goes forwards and backwards... Right? What we have here is the infinite, <coughs> pardon me, the infinite in itself has no parts and no limit. But if something has no parts and no limit, we can't really comprehend it. Because as finite beings, our comprehension itself depends upon understanding the limit of the very concepts we're talking about, right? Think of it for a moment. If I, if I give you a concept, maybe I'll give, use my cup again. I give you the concept of cup, right? In order for you to understand what the concept of cup entails, right, you have to know something about what counts as a cup, about the essence of cups. In order to know the essence of a cup, you have to know what would count as a characteristic of a cup and what would not count as a characteristic of a cup. But notice that understanding what a characteristic of a cup is and knowing what it is not designates a limit, a line between the two. But, and so, in fact, comprehensibility as such, understanding as such, it, for at least for a finite being, requires 
a recognition and articulation of limit principles. There is no essential limit principle for God, which means God is fundamentally incomprehensible. Now, it's interesting here because if God were an innate idea, then it would be an innate idea that no one would understand. So you could see here, the problem if we're to like import Pascal into Descartes would be, if God is an innate idea, I don't really know what that idea even entails, which means I can't actually comprehend it. So is it really an idea or is it just a word, right? So what Pas what's Pascal's claim? Well, he thinks that it cannot be known if God exists or what God is as a consequence of God's infinite nature. And you're going to see when we get to Pas Pas Spinoza here in a moment that Spinoza also is operating around this question of the infinity of God. But you can see if I don't even know what God means, then I certainly don't know if God exists or not either. And certainly my concepts, that is, it, I, certainly an argument for God's existence it could not be given because the idea itself is incomprehensible. So this leads us to this final sort of question, which is, is it reasonable to believe in God? And in particular, for Pascal, the question is, can a Christian such as himself give reason of his own belief, right? Um, but you can see here the question is, is it reasonable to believe in God? Now, if you're familiar with the other arguments for God's existence, you'll know that the other arguments for God's existence tend to be about, uh, tend to take the form of what we would call a natural theology. That is, they begin and try to articulate baseline conceptions of why God would have to exist in one way or another. Uh, but most of those arguments for God's existence, the classic arguments such as Thomas Aquinas' five arguments or even the ontological argument by Thomas Aquinas or the ontological argument by Descartes, none of these are specifically Christian arguments. I really think that Pascal means this to be, and it is in fact, a really cr highly centric Christian argument, though I think he would apply um, to Islam as well. Um, so let's think about it here. So it starts off with this. First and foremost is there is a choice that has to be made. Either God is or he is not, right? Either God exists or God doesn't exist. It's really simple. And the argument here is you have to choose number one. So everyone must choose an answer to this question. You can see you either choose the first part, God is, or you choose the second part, God is not. So you have to make a choice. And to not choose is to still choose choose in one way or another, because I think what Pascal would say is that if you refuse to choose, then really what you're choosing is that God is not, right? So what we're going to do here is Pascal says, you know, okay, so these arguments for God's existence don't work because of the infinitude and the, or the infinite nature of God. The question is whether or not is it reasonable to believe in God? Well, let's put it in the context of a wager, a bet. Let's imagine that you're in the Las Vegas uh, of Christian philosophy here, right? And here's the wager. Either God is or he is not. Now, you can either answer, yes, God is, or you can answer, no, God does not exist. Now, now we don't know because we don't have the proof, and it's not actually in principle possible to get a proof because of God's infinite nature. We don't know if God is, exists. So if we believe God is, exists, if we wager that, yes, he exists, that wager is going to either be correct or it's going to be incorrect. And conversely, if we wager that God does not exist, that wager will also either be correct or incorrect. So you have to choose, and one way or another, you're going to be right or you're going to be wrong. Now, you may not know until you're dead, right? <laughs> um, when, when you go to heaven or hell, as it were, or nothing happens, and then you just don't know, period, right? So you have to choose. Now, let's take a look at the first option, right? The first option is pretty simple. If, if you argue that God exists, right, if you wager that God exists, then it, and let's imagine you're correct, right? So I say I believe in God, and I'm right. God does exist. Well, from Pascal's perspective, and again, I'm giving you the simplified version of the argument, if you're correct, that means you gain eternal life. Or in other words, you gain everything, right? Because now you believe the right thing, you believe it is true, and you also get eternal life. Notice the specific Christian um element to it. Now, imagine, for instance, you're incorrect, right? Let's imagine, for instance, that, that you're wrong, and even though you believe God exists, he doesn't exist. Well, what do you lose? Nothing. You don't lose anything. In fact, you probably become a moral person as a consequence and probably live a happier life. So, even if you're wrong and you believe God exists, 
You don't lose anything, you might actually gain something. So it looks like if you wager that God exists, you're likely to gain something and you don't really lose anything. But let's imagine that, for instance, you say, no, God doesn't exist, right? Well, if you're correct and God doesn't exist, well, you've gained nothing, right? Because you're still just going to die and be evaporated into existence, and that's the end, right? So the correct notion, so if you're correct that God doesn't exist, it doesn't matter, right? Um, in fact, you, in fact, what you might say, I would, Pascal doesn't say this, but I think what you might gain is a type of nihilism. We'll see that at the end of our video lectures when we look at Nietzsche. But what if you're incorrect? What if you're wrong, you think that God does not exist, and you're wrong? Well, the problem here is you're going to face eternal judgment. In other words, you're going to lose everything. So you can see here that the wager Pascal is saying is that if God, God either is or he is not, and if he is, then you're either going to gain eternal life and gain everything, but you'll lose nothing if you're wrong. Maybe you'll just be a moral person. But if you say that he doesn't exist and you're right, you don't win anything. But if you're wrong, you're not only going to potentially go to hell, but you lose everything. So the question is, well, what, what will you choose? Does God exist or not? It can't be proven through reason, according to, um, to Pascal. But he thinks that when you take a look at the possibilities, there's only one clear answer that you should wager, right? There's only one bet you should make, and that is that God exists. So this argument is, I think, quite brilliant. It's fascinating. A lot of people attack it, and there's good reason to be critical of the argument. But I think what this argument provides is it sort of provides, okay, it, it provides at least a baseline notion for us to say that even if we can't prove God's existence, we can say that there is some reasonability to believing in God. So simply because, even though if you don't know God exists, and simply because the arguments for God's existence don't work, is not sufficient justification to fully um, claim that the person who says that God exists is a fool, right? And so Pascal is trying to protect here the notion that really what you ought to bet is that God exists, right? And think here that one of the one other thing I should mention about Pascal uh, or let me just leave it off there. One of the things I should mention about Pascal is notice here that even though there may be no proof for God's existence, this means that for Pascal, religious belief does not have to be irrational. In fact, I think he would argue that, ir that beliefs which are irrational should be rejected, but that the belief in God is not necessarily irrational precisely because uh, it's about probability, right? Um, so it's fascinating argument. It, it again, it doesn't prove anything, but it, if if it does prove anything, it perhaps only proves um, that there's strong reason to hazard the guess that God exists. Right? Okay. Let's take a look at Baruch Spinoza. Okay. Um, now Baruch Spinoza, he lived in roughly the same time period from 1632 to 1677. He was born in Amster, um, Amsterdam, Holland. Um, he was Jewish, and that's important. Uh, but even though he was Jewish, he was considered a heretical thinker, uh, both uh, by Christians and by the Jewish community. So he was considered a heretic. Uh, but in his day and age, uh, while that was politically sensitive, and if you read the history of his biography, there's a number of points in his life where this became problematic, and I won't go into that here. But it is important to recognize that even though he was a heretical thinker, he was still writing and doing work on these issues. Um, and this represents an important element that begins with Descartes in modern philosophy too. That before Descartes, the philosophy of the Middle Ages is known as scholastic philosophy. Um, and it's primarily known as scholastic philosophy because during that period, the Middle Ages, the majority of the philosophy was done was scholarship-based philosophy. What do I mean by that? I mean, I mean that most philosophers principally just interpreted older philosophers, mainly Aristotle and Plato and others, uh, but mainly Aristotle and Plato, and then would provide, you know, supplementary arguments or supplementary interpretations of their work. In other words, most of the philosophy of the Middle Ages was essentially, um, if you will, branches of philosophical argument related to these core group of philosophers of Plato and Aristotle, core Greek philosophy. After Descartes, and I think part of it has to do exactly with Descartes' methodology, 
doubt all things that can be doubted. What can be known? Everyone can use a method to figure out what is known. You don't have to just read it out of Plato and believe it. You can think for yourself. Um, and we see this with Descartes, and we see it in all of the subsequent philosophers after Descartes. So we, even though Spinoza, you might say, is the closest person philosopher to being a Cartesian, um, he is his own thinker. Um, and he, so he argues things that Descartes definitely disagrees with, um, and the, a lot of people disagreed with. But this is a mark of this era, that it's in this area, which is really sort of the, the, at, the at the high point, of the scientific revolution, in which what we see is we see a, a type of rationalism really expanding. Rationalism, again, philosophically, refers to an epistemological stance. Remember, epistemology has to do with your theory of knowledge. Rationalism is the epistemological stance that some things can only be known through the workings of reasoning and thinking, not through sensation, not through our experience of the world. And we'll see that Spinoza really follows through in this train of thought. In fact, he use, utilized what I'm calling as a geometric proof style. Or if you sometimes it's also referred to as a geometric demonstration. And this means that essentially if you've taken geometry, and it, you, if you've taken geometry, you probably remember doing proofs in geometry using theorems and then right, articulating, okay, these are the theorems, and from these theorems, this would be the case, and this would be the case, and you finally come to a conclusion, right? Uh, most of us are familiar with that. In logic, we also conduct lots of proofs. Um, but what we'll see here is his entire philosophy is organized as a geometric proof. He always starts with definitions. He then goes into um, axioms, into um, propositions, into postulates, into theorems. He, it looks like you're reading a book in geometry. Uh, this makes it actually pretty difficult to understand him. And I think that you're going to find that his reading, his, his style of writing, while very precise and clear, is extremely dense and difficult. So, and unfortunately, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to overcome those challenges in this video. So hopefully I'll be able to. Now, there's three key principal works that uh, Spinoza authored. The first two he authored in his lifetime, and they were published in his lifetime. The first is The Principles of Descartes' Philosophy. You can see right there, he's a thinker, a Cartesian thinker of sorts, which you can say is he's a rationalist. There's also another important text of his, The Theologico-Political Treatise. Um, and then finally was The Ethics, which was published in 1678, the year after his death. And you'll probably get a sense of why it was published after his death as we begin to go through it. Ultimately, one of the things that he's going to be arguing for is what we call pantheism. And this is pretty controversial stuff. Now, think of this, because what I'm going to do in the next video here and in the next time we have, is I'm going to go through all of the propositions that, and all of the things that he claims, so that way we can be clear together as a class in the video of what his views are. Um, I'm not going to have time, unfortunately, to go through all of the arguments that Spinoza gives. So, but this screen here gives you a general view of what he thinks in general about things. Okay. Now, the first here is that all matter is governed by mechanistic laws. Okay, hold on a second. So, matter, physical matter, is governed by mechanistic laws. So, Spinoza clearly is committed to the edicts of the scientific revolution and to the and to the form of materialism towards which it gives way. It's also important to recognize that this, this notion is also in conformity with Hobbes, who we've looked at, his view regarding the nature of things as being material. We'll see, and this is an important thing, is that Spinoza rejects dualism. Remember that dualism refers to the metaphysical or the ontological supposition that reality is fundamentally composed of two things, right? For Descartes, those two things were thinking and physical extension in space, right? Or the mind and the body. We're going to see that Spinoza rejects this. So even though you might say he's a rationalist philosopher, he does not conclude in the same place as Descartes. And you'll see why pretty quickly. The another important thing that we are going to talk about directly today is that for Spinoza, God is not a transitive cause. That is God is not did not cause the world in terms of him in terms of God being something outside of nature. 
right? God does not transcend nature. We're going to see that God for Spinoza is an imminent cause. That is, God is embedded and imbued in nature. That is, na or maybe I should say the reverse. Nature is embedded within God, right? God is the imminent cause of things, right? So God is an inherent energy. Well, let me give you an example here of what I might mean by that. This, and hopefully, you know, there may be some Spinoza scholars watching who know Spinoza better than I, uh, who might disagree with the analogy. Um, I encourage them to put their comments in, in the comment box if that's the case. But here's maybe a sort of example. Think of it this way. When I, like for instance, right now I'm using an Apple computer to make this video, a Macintosh. Now, the designers at Apple are a transitive cause to the computer right now, right? So what I'm doing in the computer, that I'm using the computer to record this video, well, that designer at Apple is transitive cause, right? They're not in the computer doing anything, right? Now, by contrast, what we could say is that the computer has an operating system that is the imminent cause that is, it is imminently responsible for what's occurring on my computer right now. And this is maybe a, a sort of analogous sense to what Spinoza means. That is, God is not somewhere else and just sort of plopped the world into existence and went away. But rather, God is imbued in the universe and makes the universe possible in the here and in the now. So, you can think of this, God is inherent energy, actually. God is actually substantial, that is, God is substance, in fact. And we'll see that this is a pretty remarkable claim, because God is an infinite substance, right? And, and we, by contrast, as individuals, are not. So it's going to be, what are we then, is an interesting question that Spinoza will bump up against. Another claim is that God has to exist, necessarily. And all of this means that God is not a person. So we have to be pretty clear here that the, the concept of God that um, Spinoza is advocating for is totally different from any sort of classic Christian religious perspective on God, any sort of classic Jewish perspective on God, any sort of classic um, Islamic perspective on God. In fact, it is straight different than any sort of religious conception. It is a conception of God that is purely 100%, at least I think, motivated by reasons. Um, so this is a rational God par excellence, but God is not a person as such. Now, I mentioned the question, well, okay, if God is substance, then what are we, right? What are we? Now, remember, or not remember, but Spinoza is going to agree with Pascal and Descartes that God is infinite, right? He also thinks that you can't conceptualize the infinite as such. That doesn't mean, you can't conceptualize in a positive sense, it doesn't mean that you can't use the concept for Spinoza, though, right? But what are we as finite beings? Well, it looks like what Spinoza's argument is, is that all finite things are modes of God's substances. And in fact, this term mode is a critical piece. It's a critical part of Spinoza's metaphysical architecture. That is, all of the things that we're experiencing are actually aspects or modes of the one substance in the universe, which is God. Right? And this includes both our mind and our bodies. Right? And this means that his view of God is equivalent to a form of pantheism. And pantheism here, I forgot, he, I, in Latin, he gives the Latin determination, but it means, something like every, it means something like God is everything or all is God, is what pantheism means. Pan means all and theism means God. So it means God is all is really what it means. But the notion here is that God is everything. Now, classically, there, you may be familiar with, for instance, forms of um, pan, um, forms of religious belief which are pantheistic in nature, where people think that everything is a part of God in some way or another. And that's a similar view to Spinoza's, except that for Spinoza, all of this is based upon abstraction and rational um, articulation. It's not based upon our experience of nature or anything like that. So this, this entails, of course, a rejection of the mind-body dualism that we saw with Descartes. So you can see here that Spinoza, while he's certainly indebted to Descartes, and he certainly sort of, I think, rides on the coattails of Descartes, if you will, he does not go to the same place as Descartes, right? Um, he drives to a different location, as it were. 
uh, in, we see a rejection of mind-body dualism. And I think what you really see in Spinoza, or at least my interpretation of Spinoza, and again, I don't consider myself a Spinoza scholar, so um, many other folks understand this stuff much better than I and have read much more in it. But from my perspective, what this means is that the, I think Spinoza uses this concept of God in a pantheistic sense. I don't think pantheism is the right word. I think it's a monistic conception. I think that for Spinoza, all things that exist ultimately can only exist insofar as they're imminently sourced in the nature of God. There's only one reality, really, and that's God. Everything else comes out of that as a mode or a form, a, a sort of kind of modality of that. Right? Um, so that's the way I sort of see it, instead of thinking of it in terms of naturalistic religion or something like this. Now, what's our approach and what do I want to do with what we're doing on? Now, as I mentioned before, Spinoza utilizes this geometric approach in which he provides axioms, definitions, and propositions. What I want to do in this video is I want to go through those definitions, those axioms, and those propositions for the first and the second part of the ethics. Um, and I will, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not going to beat around the bush. It is going to be a slog, and right? Um, he's very precise and very um, specific in all of his argumentation, simply because of the nature of this course and the video series and the time it takes. I don't have the time to go through all of the demonstrations. That is, if you read Spinoza, you'll see he'll give a proposition and then he'll give a demonstration of some of those propositions. But I'm going to leave the demonstrations and the core arguments for you to review, simply because there's just absolutely no way I can get through it. You'll feel this way by the end of the video. Um, one of the things you may want to do as you're watching this video is pause it, take a break, come back to it. Now again, my goal in this video is just to lay out for you what his claims are. And I think what you'll see is that all links together in a very nice way. But the more particular questions are going to require an analysis of these demonstrations. And maybe this is something we can talk about together. Uh, but for sake of brevity, I'm not going to go through all of that. Um, and I have to be honest with you, I'm a bit concerned that this video might become a little bit boring and laborious. So if it is, I apologize. So, But let's just jump into it to start with, right? Okay, let me take a drink of water. Now, in each of the sections of Spinoza's text, he builds out um, a, basically a geometric demonstration argument uh, for each part, so th which are separate from the first part and the second part. So we're going to start with the first part of the ethics of God. And this, and this is really a metaphysical treatise. Don't be fooled. Of course he's concerned with ethics, uh, but we're not going to be talking about that. We're really talking about his metaphysics. That is, in order to understand how God acts in the world and understand how we ought to act in the world and how we ought to understand our own place in the world, we have to begin by first understanding what God is, and we have to first understand how Spinoza is going to make this argument that God's an infinite substance, and that all of the things that we experience in reality are simply modalities of that singular, or I should say, that infinite substance, okay? So, in, 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 in typical fashion, he starts off with a series of definitions and I want to sort of be quick with these, but they are important to be clear. Now, by the, the whenever he says a cause itself, what Spinoza is referring to is he's referring to, quote, that whose essence involves existence or whose nature cannot be conceived except as existing. Now, here immediately to understand what he means by this, something is the cause of itself is if its own essence evolves existence. Now, we looked at this with Descartes um, two videos back, but remember, we can distinguish essence and existence. Essence is, the, is a reference to what something is, that is, the essential or characteristic features of a thing, and the, and the existence refers to that something is, right? It's just bare existence. It either is or it isn't. Now, what he's saying here is something is the cause of itself, if its essence and its existence are on the same plane, if they're ultimately the same thing. Now, the only thing that can be the cause of itself is going to be God, right? Um, we're going to see that pretty quickly. I cannot be the cause of myself because my essence, who I am, my characteristic features do not uh, also entail the proposition that I have to exist, right? Because at one point, I'm not too happy about it, but at one point, I too, just like you, are going to die. 
and when I die, my existence will be annihilated. But after I die, people will still be able to know who I was. In other words, my essence will still be accessible even though it no longer entails existence. So I am not the cause of myself, consequently. The only thing that could be the cause of itself is something whose existence and essence are combined. Okay. Now, what is finite in its own kind? Well, for Spinoza, something is finite in its own kind refers to that which can be limited by another of the same nature. So, I'm finite in my own kind, and I can be limited by another being like me, right? Something of my same kind. Now, when I say the same nature, same kind, I can also think of it in terms of physical reality too, right? So this cup is finite in its own kind because it can be limited by me physically. We're both physical things in space. We have bodies, extension, and there's a limit to it, right? So something is finite in its own kind, basically, if it can have a limit. Now, that's the question of, of, of what kind of being a thing can be, but what does it mean to have being itself? What does it mean to have substance, right? Uh, for Spinoza, a substance refers to what is in itself and is conceived through itself. That is, that whose concept does not require the concept of another thing from which it must be formed. So, the notion of the substance, although it's highly abstract for Spinoza, ultimately entails the bottom ground of what something can be at all, right? It's what is in itself and conceived through itself, and it doesn't require the concept of another thing. Ultimately, this is the, the, the basic nature of being as such is, for Spinoza, substantial. And this means that God is going to be a substance because God, from Spinoza's perspective, as an infinite being, right, is in itself and conceived through itself, right? Now notice that, right? I don't have to conceive of God for God to be a substance. Only God has to conceive of itself through itself, right? So I, in order for God to have substance, it isn't required that I conceive of it as being the substance, right? That's an important sort of element. element. Think of it this way. Substance is self-referential or self-identity to some degree, okay? Now, an attribute. What is an attribute? Well, an attribute is when the intellect is what the intellect perceives of a substance as consisting its essence. It's quite simple. An attribute is, an, is something that we attribute to something, or it is some sort of characteristic feature relative to the essence of a thing, right? Um, so, for instance, you can see this thing. This is a, a pencil, and this is a blue pencil. Now, as a blue pencil, it's being blue is an attribute for its essence, right? Um, so it can't be a blue pencil if it doesn't also have the attribute of being blue, right? The important thing is here is that some, some characteristic features are merely um, contingent or are not related to the essence of a thing. So for instance, my name is Mark Thorsby. I have a particular history. I have a certain DNA and so on and so forth. All of those might be elements or attributes of my essence, right? But, for instance, what if I, for instance, tell a joke and someone thinks I'm funny? Well, is in order to understand who I am, do you have to also know that I can sometimes be funny? And the answer is no, you don't. So, being funny, while it's nice, is merely accidental. It's not an attribute of what I am as a being, right? So, number five, finally here, modes. And remember, mode is this key term for Spinoza. A mode refers to the affections of a substance, right? The affects of a substance, or it's that which is in another thing through which it is also conceived, right? So a mode, let's just say that again, a mode refers to when something is conceived through another thing, okay? And this is ultimately what Spinoza is going to believe about God and ourselves, is that we are modes of the infinite substance. So God is what is conceived in itself and through itself as a substance, right? God has certain attributes, of course, but that we as human beings are modes of that substance, right? So in other words, our existence is derivative from God's. And we'll see also Spinoza argues that this all happens according to a determination of God's substance. So it looks like, um, for the most part, um, Spinoza believes in a deterministic world, right? So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Now, number six, God is absolutely infinite, right? God is a substance consisting of an infinity of attributes 
or which each one expresses an eternal and an infinite essence. Okay. Now it all is a um, one moment here. Now Spinoza makes uh, a point to say that God is absolutely infinite, and he distinguishes the notion of the infinite from that which is absolute infinity. That which is absolute infinity has to exist, right? Uh, it's eternal and it's an infinite essence. The notion of infinity as such doesn't necessarily entail God, per se, because you can think of an infinite series line, series of numbers, and this kind of thing. So you can think of mathematical infinity. But absolute infinity is what God is for Spinoza. And again, this is a substance consisting of an infinity of attributes, right? So there's a whole, there, because God's essence is endless, that means God's attributes are also endless, um, or which each one of these attributes expresses something that's eternal and in, infinite in itself, right? So you can even have, uh, Spinoza seems to suggest infinities of infinity relations. Now, and it's really interesting here, of course, Spinoza was unaware of what today we can think of as set theory. Set theory refers to the mathematics of infinity, uh, and so there's some interesting questions here related to set theory that we're not going to have time to go into, but perhaps that's something you'd like to follow up with on your research, your own research. Okay. Now, the definition of free. What is that which is free? Spinoza says freedom refers to that which that thing which exists from the necessity of its nature alone and is determined to act by itself alone. A thing is called necessary, or rather compelled, uh, which is determined by another to exist and to produce an effect in a certain and in a deterministic manner, right? So, there's relations here. Something is free when it acts purely under its own essence, right? And it acts necessarily out of that essence. It is not determined by anything else. Whereas something is necessary or when it's compelled to act because of a deterministic um, effect or a deterministic antecedent cause in a... Um, consequent effect, right? So this is the notion of free. I think it, for the most part, conforms to our ordinary consensus of what freedom is, this sort of metaphysical freedom, right? Something is free if it's not predetermined. It's pretty simple. Now, eternity. What is eternity? Eternity refers to existence itself, insofar as it is conceived to follow from the definition alone of the eternal thing, right? So eternity is existence, I guess, ad infinitum, because of the infinite attributes of God's essence. Okay, now to start out the discussion, you're probably thinking, really, we're just starting, um, are our axioms. Now, what is an axiom? An axiom refers to really something that's taken as being self-evidently the case. In other words, in geometry, for instance, you use axioms to make proofs, right? The axiom are the things that are unquestioned. So we're not going to start out here trying to prove these axioms. Rather, we're going to use these axioms to make subsequent proofs and propositions later on, okay? So let me go through this, and, there, and I noticed here there's a couple of um, spelling errors, which unfortunately always seems to um, cloud my videos, so I apologize, and I thank you for your patience. So there's seven axioms that Spinoza articulates in this first section of the ethics. The first is whatever is, is either itself or in another, right? So something that exists is either gonna be existing in itself, Right? Or it exists through another thing. Right? That makes sense. Axiom 2. What cannot be conceived through another has to be conceived through itself. So that means that it's a binary choice. Either you conceive it through something else or it's conceived through itself. Right? Um, so if you can't conceive it through another, it has to be conceived through itself. Now, this axiom is really important. right? Because since I can't conceive of the infinite through something which finite... That must be that I can conceive of the infinite through the concept of itself, through the infinite, through the infinite. So that means that our conception of the infinite is not necessarily, we don't have to reject the idea that we can conceive of the infinite. But we have to recognize that we can only conceive of the infinite by our first articulating and understanding what follows out of and through the infinite itself. So the infinite we're going to see comes the ground, the baseboard for all of the subsequent reflections that Spinoza gives. Axiom three, from a given determinate cause, the effect follows necessarily, right? So if you have a, a cause that determines something else, whatever happens subsequently has to happen, right? And conversely, if there is no determinate cause, well, there has to be, it must be impossible 
for an effect to follow. That is, something can't come from nothing, and so it's impossible for an effect to occur without an antecedent cause. That antecedent cause is what he means by determinate cause. But it, So if you've got a determinate cause, you get an effect. If there is no determinate cause, there is no effect. Not very controversial, makes a lot of sense. Axiom 4. The knowledge of an effect depends on and involves the knowledge of its cause, right? So if you want to understand something as an effect, you have to also understand something about its cause. Why? Because there's a determinate dependency between the two. Axiom 5. Things that have nothing in common with one another also cannot there, thereby be understood through one another, or the concept of the one does not involve the concept of the other. So if you have two things and they're not in common with the other, you can't understand one through the other, right? Pretty simple too, because why? There's no connection between them. There's no common relationship, right? So that means that the only things that can be understood through each other are things which have a common relationship to each other, okay? Axiom six, a true idea has to agree with its object, right? So if you have a true idea, it should agree with its object as being true as well. Axiom seven, if a thing can be, can, can be conceived as not existing, its essence does not involve existing. Now, this seventh axiom is really, really important because it means that if a thing cannot be conceived of exist, uh, can, if a thing can be conceived as not existing, so for instance, take my cup, I can easily and you can easily imagine this cup doesn't exist. Well, if that's the case, then it means that its essence does not also entail existence. So that means pretty much everything we experience on a day-to-day -day level of our world, right? From books and pencils and pens to glasses and people, all of these things we can imagine as not existing. As such, none of these things can involve existence in their essence, okay? Um, they're all contingent or accidental things, if you will. Okay, so what's going to follow is no, I'm sorry, this is a mistake. It shouldn't say the postulates, but the propositions. We're going to see that what, using these axioms and these definitions, what Spinoza then does is he goes step by step and he starts arguing for propositions. He's going to make claims based upon the composition of these axioms and definitions. And there's also other postulates and proofs in, in there too. Uh, so he does a lot. It's really quite complex and it's quite remarkable. I, I can't help reading, I'll be honest, Spinoza's not my favorite philosopher, but you're reading him, there's, it's quite impressive what he manages to do and what he's able to argue here. Um, it's quite brilliant, in fact. And it, and it really takes things up a notch from Descartes, I think, in terms of the rigor. Um, so what are the propositions, not postulates? The first proposition, and I'm just going to go through these. And remember, each one of these, Spinoza gives detailed arguments for. But what I want us to do in this video is just get a sense of what the propositions are so we know what claims he's making in his metaphysics, um, in the ethics, right? <laughs> so first proposition, a substance is prior in nature to its affections, right? So um, everything in, so there's a relation between the effects of a thing, like what a thing can do and what sort of things it entails, versus what the substance that a thing is. The substance has logical priority in nature to the affect. So that means that basically saying, and that follows quite clearly, is that if, if you have an affect, it must be derived from some sort of substance in some sort of way. So the substance has priority. And when you have two substances that have different attributes, that have nothing, I'm sorry, two substances having different attributes have nothing in common with one another. So if you have two substances and they have completely different attributes, then they're not in common, right? So take for instance, the cup and me, right? You can say that the essence of me is really nothing in common with the essence of the cup, in which case we have different attributes, which means we don't have things in common with, in, with one another. Now, I have to be a bit careful there because there is something in relationship between me and the cup, Namely, that we're both material, physical bodies, right? A cup can only be a cup if it has a body, and a person can only be a person if they also have a body. So embodiment and extension in space and spatiality seem to be essential features of my essence as well as the cup. So maybe not the best example, but I think you'll get the idea. And really what we're thinking of here is think about myself in the substance of God, right? They don't, we don't, do we have anything in common with each other and this kind of stuff? Proposition three, 
if things have nothing in common with one another, one of them cannot be the cause of the other, right? That makes sense too, because it looks like, and th think this, think about this in relation to the principle Descartes sets out in the beginning of the third meditation, where Descartes said that only something with as much requisite reality can, only something with as much or more reality um, can that thing be a cause of something else. This is a similar articulation, except he's saying that things that, are, that have nothing in common with each other can't be the cause of one another. Again, doesn't seem controversial. It does seem to fall from the axioms and the definitions. Now, two, this is proposition four, two or more distinct things are distinguished from one another, either by a difference in the attributes of the substances or by a difference in their affections, right? So this is how we can begin to distinguish two different things. We either distinguish them through attributes of substance or through the differences of their affect, right? Um, they're the things that they're, the characteristic features that are pronounced when they're instantiated in space. Right? Now, Proposition 5. In nature, there cannot be... Uh, uh, that, this is a, a typo right here, I see. In nature, there cannot be two or more substances of the same nature or attribute. And this makes sense, too, because you can't have... Uh, there cannot be two, two or more substances of the same nature and attribute because... If something, if you take two things and they both have the same um, um, attributes and they both have the same substantial character, then what that means is that they're identical. They're the same thing, in fact. This actually get re we're going to look next week when we look at Leibniz. But Leibniz articulates what's known as the doctrine of indiscernibilities. And the notion here is this: is that if two things are indiscernible and if all of their essential features are indiscernible, that is, they're the same, then the thing is the same thing. Right, so and this is the basic idea um, that Spinoza is raising here in this proposition. Now, keep if we keep going, what we can say is that one substance can't be produced by another substance. Right, um, that makes sense. Um, number seven, it also pertains to the nature of a substance that it exists. Right, that also makes sense because if it doesn't exist, then it can't be a substance based on the definition. So what this means is that. The, no, no, keep in mind, one substance can't be produced by another substance because there's a distinction between types of substances, but it, substances have to exist, which means, Proposition 8, every substance is necessarily infinite, right? Every substance has to be infinite. And I'm going to read you a passage here from the text um, where, he, in his demonstration, what Spinoza says is this. He says, a substance of one or more attribute does not exist unless it is unique, Proposition 5, and it pertains to its nature, Proposition 7. Of its nature, therefore, it will exist either as infinite or finite, but, as, but not as finite. For then, by deduction 2, it would have to be limited by something else of the same nature, which would also have to exist necessarily according to Proposition 7. And so there would be two substances of the same attribute, which is absurd. Therefore, it exists as infinite. So there can only be one thing which exists as a substance, and that thing is something which is infinite. So how are we to understand this? Well, the infinite is, can on the one hand, be understood as the absolute affirmation of existence. right? And notice here, think about when we say, when we talk about existence. Everything in the universe that exists participates in existence, which means that existence is infinite, right? Because every, because it entails everything, right? Finite, that which is finite is really just the negation of the infinite, right? So a finite substance cannot, be, cannot include existence, right? A finite substance cannot include existence. We've looked at that already. So, quote, whatever is of such a nature that there can be many individuals must, to exist, have an eternal cause to it. So, we know that, for instance, there's multiple humans throughout the world, right? Congratulations, you're one of them. And then because there's all these different humans, it must be, since substances are infinite, that all of us have to have some sort of eternal cause to us. We must have the infinite as our cause, as it were. Okay, so, one moment. So the more reality of a being, so the more reality of being that each thing has, the more attributes that will belong to it, right? That also makes sense, um, right? Because Why? Because ultimately, because 
the more reality it has is based in the infinite substance that it has. I guess it, it participates in a greater share of the infinite and therefore it has more attributes that belong to it. Proposition 10. Each attribute of a substance must be conceived through itself. Right? Each attribute of a substance must be conceived through this infinite substance. Now God, Proposition 11, God, or a substance consisting of infinite attributes, each of which expresses eternal and infinite essence, necessarily exist. Now, you have to stop here for a moment and be clear here. Um, he's already included God in his definition, right? So we're, so we're beginning with the supposition that we've understood God as being infinite, right? But when you also take into account his argument related to sub substance here, what you end up with is that God is as a, sub sub as a substance consisting of infinite attributes has to necessarily exist. Um, why? Because substance itself entails it, right? Because of the infinitude of substance. And well, Spinoza, whoa, okay, I've lost us. Um, let me go back here. For Spinoza, perfection, because God is a perfect being, perfection asserts existence. And this is in line with the ontological argument that Descartes gave us in, I believe, the fifth meditation, right? And there the notion is quite simple, right? Is that God, if it's truly perfect, the most perfect being is also a being which exists. But you can see here, Spinoza wants to go one further than Descartes and argue that the perfection asserts existence because of the infinitude of substantiality itself, right? In relation to his overarching theme, okay? So, how are we going to move from here? Well, what this means is that there's no attribute of a substance can be truly conceived from which it follows that the substance can be divided. Let me say that again. No attribute of a substance can truly be conceived from which it follows that the substance can be divided. Let me take a brief moment here and give you some of the um, commentary that um, Spinoza gives uh, for his demonstration of this claim. He says, for the parts into which a substance so conceived would be divided either will retain the nature of the substance or it won't, right? So that is, if you take a substance, you divide it into parts, it's either going to contain the, contain the nature of the substance or it won't. The parts will. Now, if the first is the case, um, that is, they retain the nature of the substance, then, by Proposition 8, each part will have to be infinite, and by Proposition 7, to its own cause. And by Proposition 5, each part will have to consist of a different attribute. And so many substances will be able to be formed from one, well, which is absurd by Proposition 6. So furthermore, the parts by Proposition 2 would have nothing in common with their whole, and the whole, um, by Deduction 4 and Proposition 10, could both be and be conceived without its parts, which is also absurd, and so no one would be able to doubt it. But if the seconds asserted, namely that the parts will not retain the nature of substance, then since the whole substance would be divided into equal parts, it would lose the nature of the substance and would cease to be, which, by Proposition 7, is also absurd. Now that's the proof, he thinks, for why we have to accept the claim that no attribute of a substance can truly be conceived from which it follows that the substance can be divided. Um, okay, so Proposition 13. A substance which is absolutely infinite is therefore indivisible. It cannot be divided. So the substance itself, taken as a substance, is indivisible. So it has no parts and no whole. And remember, this earlier concept of the infinite as not being odd and even and all this stuff that we looked at with Pascal. You can see Pascal and Spinoza are in something of theoretical agreement, at least at this point. Now, except for God, there can be no substance, I'm sorry, except God, no substance can be or be conceived, okay? So only God exists and can be conceived, right? So God, and as this is at this point in the argument, God is unique, and that means that there is only one absolute infinite substance, which as we learned earlier, is indivisible. So this means that an extended thing and a thinking thing are, at, are either attributes of God or affections of God's attributes. So what, what he's going to say here is that an ex thing that exists in space, that has extension like my arm or the, the water cup here, right? 
Or think about a thinking thing, Descartes' cogito ergo sum. I am, I exist is necessarily true whenever I utter it or think it. Right? Cogito ergo sum, or my body, both of these must therefore be either attributes of God or affections of God's attributes. So thinking things in extension in space are both attributes of this infinite indivisible substance. Now, whatever is, is in God, and nothing can be or be conceived without God. And this is entailed because of the infinity um, of God's, or the, the substanti of the infinity of God's substance, right? Um, so that means that anything that exists has to be included within God there, somehow. Included how? Either as an attribute, or an affection, and we're going to see soon, or as a mode. Now, part 16. From the nece necessity of the divine nature, there must follow infinitely many things in infinitely many modes. Why? Or, for example, everything which can fall under an infinite intellect therefore would be a mode of God. So, since God has this infinite nature, then that means there's an infinite variety of possibilities. That is, these possibilities are what we're calling modes. So, there's an infinite number of modes which are possible. Now, from this, it follows in Proposition 17 that God acts from the laws of his nature alone, and God is compelled by no one. So, strictly speaking, since there's only one infinite substance, it's God, right? God, God is... is is its own cause, right? Which means that God is not compelled or determined by anything, which means God is free based on the definition Spinoza begins with. So God is fully free. Now, God, Proposition 18, is the imminent, not the transitive cause of all things. And I've already mentioned this, but, let, but I thought it important enough to sort of mention, uh, at least give you a quick quote here from the de demonstration that he offers us. Spinoza writes, quote, everything that is, is in God, and must, not mucked, and must be conceived through God, and so God is the cause of all things which are in him. And then outside God, there can be no substance, that is, there can be no thing which is in itself outside of God. Therefore, God is the imminent, not the transitive cause of things. And you can think of it this way, is that Transitive refers to that which is something outside of nature, or that which is outside of what could, what could exist. Clearly that can't be the case, given what Spinoza is arguing. So God has to be, has an imminent form of existence. And here you might think of it, if the transitive refers to God outside of nature, the imminent refers to God immediately as nature. And again, that's my language, not Spinoza's. Uh, but that's how we have to understand it. God, the, all of reality we're seeing is all really attributes and modalities of God's infinite substantial nature, right? So God doesn't exist somewhere else. He's right before us, as it were, right? But be careful there because God as a he is not a person, right? God's not a person. God is rather an ontological feature necessary for existence, right? So Proposition 19, God is eternal or all of God's attributes are eternal, right? So, God is eternal, or all of his attributes are eternal. Now, Proposition 20. God's existence and his essence are clearly one and the same. Now, this is a feature of the ontological argument that we've discussed in Descartes, right? So, God's existence and his essence are the same thing. So, what God is, is identical to that God is, right? Um, they're the same thing. So, Proposition 21. All the things which follow from the absolute nature of any of God's attributes have always had to exist and be infinite or are through the same attribute eternal and infinite, right? So all the things which follow from the absolute nature of any of God's attributes, right, following out of existence have to, by reason of this being having the same attribute, also be eternal and infinite, okay? So 22. By the way, this is going to work out nicely because it means that we as finite human beings also participate in God's infinity and eternality. So there's this notion that we too enjoy a portion of the eternal in virtue of our being a mode of God's substantial nature, as it were. So Proposition 22, whatever follows from some attribute of God, insofar it's modified by a modification, which through the same attribute exists necessarily and is infinite. So 
whatever follows out of the attribute of God, now that's not us, per se, uh, but as a modification, exists necessarily as infinite. So, insofar as that maybe I do exist as a modification or a mode of God, what you could say is that I exist necessarily as a mode of God, right? Um, and that that existence as a mode of God is infinite, but that doesn't mean I'm infinite. So, we got to be really careful there. So, Proposition 23 this means that every mode which exists necessarily and is infinite has necessarily had to follow either from the absolute nature of some attribute of God or from some attribute that's modified by a modification which exists necessarily and is infinite. Now that one you may want to take some time with Spinoza to unpack. Um, because we're already behind in this video, I'm just going to keep going, right? In Proposition 4, what we have, 24, we have uh, Spinoza makes the articulation that the essence of things produced by God does not involve existence. So the essence of things produced by God does not involve existence. So that means that God can produce things which have essence, but that essence does not entail existence in the same manner that God entails existence, right? Because God's essence is one and the same. But that doesn't mean that we are, since even just because we're produced as a mode of God, right? In other words, or not in other words, but subsequently in Proposition 25, God is the efficient cause, not only of existing things, but also of their essence. So what I am has also been produced by God's infinite, by the infinity of God in terms of it being an efficient cause. Now an efficient cause refers to, we talked about transitive cause, um, and, right, necessary cause. Here we have a notion of an efficient cause. Efficient cause means something just occurs before something else in time, and that, that the efficient cause is a necessary determinate feature for the effect to occur, right? So God is the antecedent determinate cause for all the other things that exist, not just what they exist, but also of all the possible essences that, are, that could ever occur, right? So all possible essences, all possible ideas are also have their, their efficient cause in God, right? So you can see here he's going much further than Descartes in another way, right? Now, Proposition 26, a thing which has been determined to produce an effect has necessarily been determined in this way by God, and one which has not been determined by God cannot determine itself to produce an effect, right? To, produ to the produced effect. Okay, let's keep going. A thing which has been determined by God to produce an effect cannot render itself undetermined, a little misspelling there, um, undetermined, right? So that means that if God makes something, whatever it is that's made can't undetermine itself and say, I wasn't made by God. That doesn't make any sense, right? Whatever it is that's determined by God follows necessarily as a consequence of God. And as a consequence, it doesn't, we cannot deny the antecedent cause. Why? Because remember, we talked about that earlier, that if something is the cause, then there's effects. If there's, no, if there's no cause, there's no effect. Here, the world, its existence, the essence of things, all of our ideas are an effect of God, right? And so we can't get rid of those, right? Um, just simply because we don't want it. You can't undetermine, a determined thing cannot undetermine itself. So what this means is that every singular thing, Proposition 28, or anything which is finite and has a determinate existence, can neither exist but uh, but be determined to produce an effect by another cause, which is also finite and has a determinate existence. And again, this cause can also neither exist nor be determined to exist and produce an effect by another, which is also finite and has a determinate existence, and so on to infinity. So you can see here is that we have singular things, and some singular things seem to determine other things, but obviously the chain of efficient causation cannot go on infinitely, uh, which is going to entail that it has an infinite, or rather, an eternal cause. We already know what that cause is. It's God's infinite substantial nature. So Proposition 29, and by the way, thanks for hanging in with me. I know this is pretty tough stuff, and it's pretty laborious, right? So Proposition 29, in nature, there is nothing contingent, but all things that have been determined from the necessity of the divine nature to exist and produce an, eff um, and produce an effect in a certain way. Okay, So nothing is purely contingent. He's committed to a deterministic universe, 
where everything that occurs occurs because it has an antecedent cause. Now, an actual intellect, right? Remember, think of yourself as a thinking thing. Here, go back to Descartes' cogito ergo sum. An actual intellect, whether it's finite like you and I or infinite like God, must comprehend God's attributes and God's affections and nothing else. Why is that the case? Well, because all of reality, because there's only one infinite substance and that's all there is, that means that any sort of intellect that exists, ultimately, no matter what it's contemplating, is ultimately comprehending attributes or affections of God and nothing else, right? That's the, the sort of monistic um, or pantheistic consequence or, or claim that's being made here. So in Proposition 31, what we see is that the actual intellect, whether finite or infinite, the will, desire, love, and all these other things and the like, must be referred to natura, uh, Latin phrase he gives, it must be referred to natura naturata and not to natura naturans. Okay. There is where you, I need to give you some background here. So what do, what the heck are these things? These are two Latin phrases. That which is natura naturans refers to what is in itself and is conceived through itself, or such attributes of substance as express an eternal and infinite essence. That is God insofar as he con is considered as the free cause. Okay. Now, the natura naturata, refers to whatever follows from the necessity of God's nature, or from God's attributes, that is, all the modes of God's attributes insofar as they consider it as things which are in God and can neither be nor be conceived without God. Okay, so the first one here is really referring to the notion of God itself, and the second is referring to that which is accidental, if you will, to God's nature. So what, go back to 31. What he's saying here is the actual intellect whether finite or infinite, must be referred here uh, to being an attribute of God's nature, not conceived as the substance of God's infinite essence. Okay? Um, oh, no. Yeah, that's right. Okay? Um, and this is because what he's trying to lay claim here is that when Descartes says, I'm a thinking thing, right? Cogito ergo sum, what, he's, what Descartes has exposed, at least for Spinoza, is that this thinking thing is a mode of God. It's not God itself, it's not infinite itself, but it is a mode of this infinite, uh, of, the, of the infinite attribute or the infinite effect, effectivity of God. Okay, so Proposition 32, this means that the will cannot be called a free cause, but only a necessary one. Okay, so I have a will to do things. The will refers to my capacity and motivation to do things. But the will, strictly speaking, is not free a cause. Why? Because my free, because as a cause, it is the effect of ultimate, or I'm sorry, it, because my will is the modality of God's infinite cause. God is determinate, I'm not. Which means that the, the will is, ulti, is, not, is not free so much as necessary. It's a necessary variation and a necessary modality of things. You can see here, ultimately, Spinoza is deeply committed to the idea that all things exist, exist in, by, through, and for, and according to God. Which means that there is no accidents in nature. It means that there, there is no... This creates the problem of evil for us and that Spinoza actually talks about. But, um, for instance, this means that... Um, when horrible things like the Holocaust happen, they still happen in accordance with God's will, right? It is because everything that occurs, even things that I conceive of as being bad, all of these things occur as a mode of God's um, affectivity or God's attributes. So there's nothing that's left to free chance. There's nothing left to chance. There's nothing left to free cause. The only thing that's free is God him himself. Proposition 33. This means that things could have been produced by God in no other way and in no other order than they've been produced. That means this is the only possible world. We'll see next week um, Leibniz makes the exact same argument, right? That all the things that exist, exist out of necessity, which means that this is the only possible world that could have ever existed. So whenever you say, if, if you will, if you want to sort of take the sort of kind of folk wisdom out of this, what you could say is that when something goes wrong in your life, you could say that, well, according to Spinoza, there was no way to avoid that wrong thing. 
because all things are produced by God and in no other way, and therefore all of them cor correspond to the necessary, um, correspond as being necessary effects to God's moda modalities and to his infinite substance. So what does this mean? It means that God's power is his essence itself. And remember, his essence is identical to his existence, right? And his essence is infinite, and it's related to, and it's ultimately, if you will, substantiated as an infinite substance out of which all of us are simply modalities. So whatever we conceive, Proposition 35, to be in God's power necessarily exists. So that means that God's, uh, God's, if God's essence includes the idea that he's all-knowing, well, then that means that, that, necessarily, that God's all-knowing nature also necessarily exists. Now here, I think, is where I personally want to inject my own criticism and think, I'm not sure the Proposition 35 follows, but in order for the brevity of the video, we're going to keep going here. But that's a point of concern, and it's a footnote for us to stop and take pause. And I think we'll see later when we get to Immanuel Kant, and we, and we discuss Immanuel Kant's views, in particular his arguments related to necessity, um, we will see a potential critique here uh, which would destabilize the uh, Spinoza's metaphysics. So Proposition 36 here is that nothing exists from whose nature some effect doesn't follow. So that means that everything that occurs, right, um, there's always an effect. No matter what exists, there's an effect. Okay, now, here's what I want to do next, and let me just take a moment here to, let me see how long our video has been going. Let me just pause the video for just a sec. Okay, thank you. I sorry, I wanted to take a moment. I wanted to see how much time we've done. We've already taken a good amount of time going over this material. That, because you can see the next part that I, I have prepared for us to talk about, is, by the way, that first part sort of concludes with the notion Really, the whole emphasis that is that God is the substance of everything and everything else is a modality. Now, what seems to occur in this second part of the ethics um, is that it concerns the nature and the origin of the mind, which is a really critical piece um, for thinking about um, his critique against dualism and his critique regarding Descartes' um, distinction between the mind and the body, both of which are really critical pieces um, to the overarching sort of theme we're looking at in this class, which is, can a subjective knowledge give rise to an objective knowledge of the world? That is, can my own subjective processes give me knowledge of the external world? Clearly, if we take Spinoza's model here, then that means that my subjective knowledge is has to be a modality of God's infinite substance, which is somehow becoming aware of other modalities of God's substance. So we're not, it's not fully clear though how all this stuff works out. And so what the second part does is Spinoza begins to lay out the origin for his conception of the mind. And if you read the ethics, it's extremely um, rigorous, and I think very, it's, again, he follows this geometric de demonstration proof. Um, so, for instance, the next thing I was going to do in the video is then go over the de definitions he gives for the origin of the mind section and the axioms. And I do want to go over this with you. And, but then the next thing is he then lays out all of the propositions. I don't think I really have time to go through all of that. I don't know if you really want me to read through all of that. But let's go through these definitions and axioms and then maybe quickly gloss over some of the propositions, and I'll leave probably most of that for you to review, simply because I don't I don't like these videos to go over an hour. It just becomes too much um, for people to really follow along. Not to mention, it's exhausting to, to record. So let's at least go through some of these definitions and axioms, so that way you could be in a prepared place to go through these propositions and proofs for Spinoza regarding the nature of the mind. Now, the first thing is we have to understand what a body is, right? A body is a... a a body refers to a mode in a certain and determinate way uh, that expresses God's essence insofar as he is considered as an ex extended thing. So remember, Descartes' notion is that a body is something that has extension in space. That really is Spinoza's idea too, except Spinoza thinks that the extension in space is also essentially a mode of God's infinite sub substance, or the infinite substance that we call God, right? Um, Number two, the essence is that which is an essence belongs to that which being given the thing it is, 
is necessarily posited and which being taken away, the thing is necessarily taken away. So the essence really refers to that which is absolutely essential for something. So if something's essential and you take away the essence, the thing disappears as well, right? So for instance, um, for Spinoza, this would mean that since God's essence and existence are the same, this means that if you took away God's existence, you would no longer have his essence, which means you'd no longer have an infinite substance. You would take away the existence of the world, right? Um, conversely, I'm a human being, and part of the essence of a human being is the human being is a rational being with ext extension in space, right? I have a body. Well, if you take away my body, you take away me. And isn't that seem to be correct? Because what, after all, is death? Death is nothing other than the loss of my extension, right? So, or a diminishment of my essence, as it were, right? So what is understanding? What does it mean to understand something? Well, understanding a concept is the same as when the mind, uh, is something that the mind forms because it is a thinking thing, right? So understanding is some sort of formation of a thinking thing. It's some sort of form of being that a thinking thing can take on, right? Now, and remember, a, a thinking thing comes directly from Descartes. I am therefore a thinking thing because I am the thing, because when I think I know I exist, so I must be a thinking thing, right? Again, he's using the Cartesian framework here um, and extending it and developing it in a, in a more rigorous and I think interesting way, uh, but also difficult way. Now, what's an adequate idea? An adequate idea, like it sounds, an idea which is just enough. In other words, it's an idea which, in insofar as it's considered in itself, without relation to an object, it has all the properties or the intrinsic denominations of, of being a true idea. So an adequate idea is that an idea taken in isolation um, has enough properties to determine it as being true. That's an adequate idea, right? Obviously an inadequate idea is an idea that is in which it is not possible to uh, reference these intrinsic denominations of being a true idea. Duration? Duration refers to an indefinite continuation of existing. Um, sorry about the misspelling there. Um, so something has duration if it continues to exist over time. Now, definition six, reality and perfection, well, they're the same thing. Why? Because perfection refers, because reality is sourced and based in God's infinite substance. God as an infinite substance is a perfect thing by definition, which means that reality and perfection have to be the same thing. Definition seven, a singular thing refers to a thing's refers to things that are finite with a determinate existence. So I am a determinate, I'm a singular thing because I have a determined existence, right? A determinate existence. Now, let's take a look here at the axioms, right? Whoops, zoom in a little close there. The axiom number one is that the essence of man does not involve necessary existence. That is, from the order of nature, it can happen equally that this or that man does not exist or does exist, right? So that, so that means that we're going to take it, remember an axiom is something that's taken as self-evidently true and used uh, essentially as a principle to make the other arguments. So we're just going to take it that a human being doesn't have to necessarily exist. Why? Because some people exist and some people don't, right? Pretty simple and pretty straightforward and I don't think controversial. Number two, man um, whoops, I've got, I made a mistake here. Let me double check here. I, man things, I, I don't think that's right. Let's get this correct. The second axiom, I'm sorry, is man thinks. Man thinks. So we take it for granted that man is a thinking thing. Okay, that's the ax second axiom. Um, third axiom is that there are no modes of thinking, such as love, desire, or whatever else is designated by the words that are apex of the mind, unless there is in the same individual the idea of the thing that's loved, desired, and the like. But there can be an idea even though there is no other mode of thinking, okay? So let's take, let's take that um, a little bit slower, right? So there's no mode such as thinking unless there's also an idea um, within an individual related to the thinking, right? Uh, so there can be an idea, but there doesn't have to be thinking.
But so it means this: if in order to have thinking, you have to have an idea. But you can have an idea, but not necessarily have a mode of thinking, such as love, desiring, or whatever else. All of these are effects of the mind. Axiom four: We feel that a certain body is affected in many ways. Right? That seems to be right. There's many different ways that a specific body can get affected. Right? Um, you can have something be tall. You can have something be large. And something be heavy. So on and so forth. Axiom five. We neither feel nor perceive any singular things except bodies and modes of thinking, right? So the only things that we perceive as singular things um, are bodies and modes of thinking. So you can see here that there's, the axiomatically, Spinoza realizes there's something right about Descartes' dualism, the difference between the mind and body, except we're going to see that for uh, Spinoza, the mind and the body are both both modes of the same infinite substance, right? So that means there's no ultimate difference between the two in terms of their ultimate reality, right? So it's not dualism. What we can say is that the difference between mind and body, between extent, things that are extended space and modes of thinking, is that they are the two primary ways in which we perceive singular things. Right? Either I perceive the singular thing as a thinking thing, i.e. as an idea, or I perceive the singular thing as something extended in space, as a being out there, as a cup, or as a book, and so forth. Okay, So those are the definitions and the axioms for the second part on the ethics, on the ethics of the nature and of the origin of mind. And so what I did next is I started laying out all the propositions, but as you can see, there are many, many, many propositions, right? Um, right, I'll just sort of give you a sense here, right? We've got, there's many different propositions. And, and the truth is, is that what I'd like to do is spend time going through these. But the truth is, is that I just don't think we have time to go through them in an adequate way that will actually be helpful for you. So what I want you to do is actually use these, but you can see here, use these definitions, use these axioms, and then go through the second part of his ethics. And what you'll find here is that he's going to ultimately, uh, well, he's going to conclude, you can start to see some of these. He's going to discuss the epistemology, what it means for, uh, an inf for us to have knowledge. What does that mean? What does it mean for a human being to have um, an adequate knowledge of, the, of God and the eternal essence of God? Um, he's going to talk about the distinction between mind and body. Right, And what you're going to see here is that really, as you go through this, is that Spinoza is going to answer the question whether or not we can subjective knowledge can yield object, objective knowledge. The answer, ultimately, for, at least from my perspective for Spinoza, is a clear yes. But the answer is, is that subjective knowledge is actually based in the objective infinite substance of God. So it is possible. That is, rationalism does become possible because rationalism itself, that is, reasoning, becomes a mode of God's infinite substance. And so that means that the subjectivity, which gives rise to objectivity, is itself based upon a more, um, I guess, primordial objectivity, the objectivity of God's infinite, necessary, substantial being. And the second thing we're going to see, or you'll see here at the end here, is that Spinoza is a rationalist philosopher, and there is a, a a large degree of relationship between his work and Descartes' meditations. Now, I apologize for not going through all of the ethics in this second part, um, but perhaps you'll thank me. I'm not sure. So do this on your own, uh, but you can see it's pretty straightforward, and I hope at least with this video you've gotten a basic understanding of what Spinoza's arguing and how Spinoza offers a pantheistic vision. And ultimately, for our perspective, looking at Pascal and Spinoza, how this concept of infinity plays an absolutely integral role in both his rationalism, um, also within Spinoza's arguments, and also within Descartes. So the notion of the infinite is really this interesting thing that we're going to keep coming back to again and again. Thank you guys very much for watching online. I appreciate your patience. Um, and I appreciate you letting me skip that second section for sake of time. Thank you very much, and I'll see you guys online. Bye.